Well, you've been asking for the 25 ounces of gold buys an entire city block. Wait until you really find, see everything that I put together here. It's even better than that coming up. I'm Lynette Zhang, Chief Market Analyst here at ITM Trading, and of course, a full service, physical gold and silver dealer, really specializing in strategies. And one of the big part of the strategies is getting everybody into position to take advantage of the inevitable collapse of the currencies. And, you know, I mean, I remember back a couple of years ago and I would say the reset that has already begun. And I was told, Oh, you can't say that you can't. And I say, I have to say that because it's true and it is all setting everything up for those that are in the right position. So no, it's not all doom and gloom. If you have your food, water, energy, security, barter ability, wealth preservation, so you hold your purchasing power, community and shelter. For those of us that have gotten into that position, we will have the ability to sustain our standard of living and take advantage of the opportunities. So let me show you where those opportunities actually lie. And we're going to start with you know, we're going to start with thriving with gold and silver during a hyperinflationary reset. And remember, I've told you there are two key things that are critical to real estate. One are the real estate taxes because governments use taxation to generate the income that they need to pay for all the spending that they do. How easy is it to spend other people's money? And the other are the mortgages. And this is going to be a two part series. So I hope you're relaxed because this is probably going to take some time. And next week I'll, I'll go into uh, some of this in three more countries, but today we're going to look at Germany, Greece, and Venezuela. So as the inflation is going up, then, well, guess what? The ability to pay with real wages, actually goes down because one thing we know a hundred percent is that in the scheme, when they were developing this fiat money strategy, they knew that real wages would never, ever, ever keep pace with inflation. So your mortgages may be fixed, but your other costs are not food, um, insurance, etc. So, the ability for people to keep and maintain their real estate, or I'm going to even say these days, the businesses that have flocked into the single family home area, the ability for them to maintain and keep that is not in my opinion and historically not very good. And that what's op that's what opens up the opportunity. You know, in the beginning, when you're getting lift off, then what you, what the government, what the central bankers want is that leverage and it makes you look richer. But when things shift, you have to have the ability, boom, to pay it off, which is exactly what the gold is about. Holding your purchasing power when everything else is losing it so that you can then go in and take advantage of that. So again, real estate risk that we're going to be looking at today is the immovable property tax. Cause you cannot put a piece of real estate on your back and move it. You can put a piece of gold in your pocket and move it. Okay. But you can't do that with real estate. And it is a third of the dynastic wealth. So that's wealth that lasts in families at least 300 years. It is a third on that stool. And this is where the opportunities lie. So let's take a look at that. I'm going to start here. If you haven't watched this whole interview, you want to, it is amazing how little people know of history, but you know, and they always think, well, this time is different. 
do you think this time is different? And, and do you think that it's going to be localized when it, like it was in Romania and when the Soviet, when Russia fell, the USSR fell? Or do you think this is more global? What do you think is going on? Well, I think the song may be different, but the tunes are similar. So uh, it's always with a different twist just because of how the global politics shifts in the meantime, of course. However, the effect on the general people is always the same. It could be a different global situation. It could be a different economical situation. However, the effect on the general public, the good old, you know, nine to five uh, people who just, their only fault is that they, they haven't paid attention. Mm -hmm. The effect on those people is always the same. And it's always suffering and losing their savings and losing their, you know, multi-generational properties, farms or something like that. It's always the same. So I try to approach it from them, from their perspective, because where we have control is truly in our lives and what we do, how to invest mm -hmm. and so on. We don't have too much control about global politics. And yes, it's good to know about those things and it's good to know how things shift so you can anticipate things. However, a lot of people focus on those things where we don't have no power and then we feel powerless and we feel that we have nothing to do. Well, of course, there are a lot of things that we can do, how we can prepare so we are not affected. Yes, it's different in the sense this time I think it will be much more global. Uh, it was sort of global even back then because yeah, the hyperinflation situation in Romania uh, was really tied together with the uh, post-Soviet hyperinflation of Eastern Europe and all these other Soviet uh, satellite states and including Russia, they suffered a lot as well. So I tried to talk about their history a little bit, the one at least from what I studied. However, this time it is I would say a bigger empire that mm -hmm. is really all across the world. You know, there's very little, very few countries in the world where they don't know what a dollar is. You know, it might have been different in back then. People knew about the Soviet Union, but they were not trading um, rubles or uh, other currencies um, in far corners of the world. Well, now they are. They are trading in dollars, right? They have. Even in Romania today, we have exchange houses and people save in dollars or save in euros. And then we use those currencies. Sometimes when we list property in Romania, we directly say it in euros or we directly say it in US dollars because we know we kind of don't have, we don't trust our own local currency anymore. That's the so key. this is a much Loss more trust global in the currency. thing and it will be much, much bigger. However, the effect on the general people is always the same. They just lose everything. Absolutely. And so, first of all, I don't want you to be the ones to lose everything. And second of all, you know, this is when wealth really shifts inside of a country. And I would like it personally, if everybody, if all of the viewers were actually the ones to have the wealth shift their way. So you might recall this book that was written in the 90s by Robert Kiyosaki and Mike Maloney. And that's actually, apparently I read that book uh, because that's actually where I got the 25 ounces of gold. So we're going to start with Germany. And I'm telling you, in this whole series, I'm doing six different currencies because people always say, well, that one doesn't count. And that one does. Well, there's 4,800 of them. Tell me that all of them don't count because this time is different. This time is not different. So when you look at expenditures back in 1912, before the hyperinflation came in, you had basically equal amounts that were going to rent, to um, food, and then to others. But food becomes the single biggest issue for people during a hyperinflationary event. You can live without some things. I mean, you can live without a shirt, but you got to eat and you got to drink. And so during the hyperinflationary event, you had what in this particular case, in Germany's case, 91.6% of whatever money they got went to food. What are they going to pay first? So if they can't pay their rent or they can't pay their mortgage, what happens? They lose the property. But when Germany's hyperinflation finally came to an end, the currency supply had grown 
from 29 billion. And actually, it increased 17 billion times and its value dropped 97.7% probably actually more than that in reality because the they were only printing one side of the of the currency the other side was blank and that's the side that had more value not the currency side the poor were so before the crisis so i mean it when you're poor there's only so far down you can go when you're wealthy and you have these tangible assets okay well then you get to expand your wealth base it's the middle class that gets hurt the most. And they're typically the ones that trust the system the most as well. Armed with a new currency backed by mortgages on Germany's agricultural and industrial property and empowered by the Reich Tag Issue Emergency Decree Under 23 Enabling Act, the government now renewed its effort to revive the housing construction industry. The very inflation which had left many destitute had provided a handsome dividend, oh my, to those who paid off their mortgages with worthless currency. And if you listen from the uh, to the interview from Arpad, he knew people that were able to pay off their mortgages, but they were in a different position than the masses because your income will not keep pace with that. So again, the very inflation that had left many destitute had provided a handsome dividend to those who paid off their mortgages with the worst currency. And so you can take real money gold, convert it into that worthless currency and get that mortgage paid off like that. And maybe buy a whole bunch more of then income producing currency. Now, what you're looking at here is a gold mark, which is a little bit more than a tenth of an ounce. So this is actually what this is showing you. But I'd like to point something out here because we've seen it. We've talked about it in our videos, the ITM videos. You see this cup formation? Oh my, there's that pattern. Is it an absolutely smooth cup? No, it isn't. But... I would also like to point out, because we've experienced this even in the manipulated spot market, we have, we have witnessed the formation and the breakout. And then, since I didn't really actually put that in here, okay, but you can see how there's like a little bit of a struggle here to get it going before it hits new highs. So this, my friends, right here, this is where we are right now. They are going to suppress that because a rising gold price is an indication of a failing currency. But if you hold your wealth in gold, which is proven for thousands of years, thousands of times, then your best shot is what we're looking at right here. This is key. That's how it works. By the time that they reset the currency, this is, you know, gold was floating. A full ounce was 87,000. But the very inflation. So this is the whole point of buying gold, part of the strategy to convert into income producing real estate. Part of the strategy is to pay off that mortgage. Part of the strategy is to have these smaller pieces of gold. And I know that this is hard to see, this is a $1 gold coin, a $1 gold coin, right? This is a five, but you have a different variety of sizes to pay those property taxes. Because if you do not pay those property taxes, you're losing the property. You want to really keep that in mind. Okay, so what happens to the mortgages? Well, during this period of time, mortgage debt was reinstated at much higher rates than government bonds were, and the reinstatement of some debts and a resumption of effective taxation on a still devastated economy tri triggered a wave of corporate bankruptcies. 
No kidding. Do you see the opportunity? You're in those stocks. Do you know which corporations are going to be able to survive this? No, because they've all just eaten and created and generated so much more debt. And there's so many more zombie corporations. But as we go through this hyperinflation, that will be wiped out. And those corporations, all the building that you see, I mean, I see it here in Phoenix all over the place. And if I didn't know better, I'd say, wow, we must be in a real boom time. But all of that, all of those mortgages, and I've shown you this, are turned into Wall Street products and sold back to you. So they've already gotten their profits out of it. They've already gotten the gains out of it. You're the one that eats it on the shorts unless you have gold. Then you can go in and you can pick up that real estate dirt flipping cheap. You can pick up stocks dirt flipping cheap. But in, in all cases, we want to make sure that it's near a bottom and we want to make sure that those corporations that can't survive are not what you're buying. You want to buy the ones that have the ability to survive. So what happens to mortgages is they get restructured and reset. And we saw that back in 2008 when the system really died. We saw that back then. And so some people may have gotten that mortgage loan modification. I know, I know somebody that did. Um, and when I looked at the modification, it was not really in their best interest. Okie dokie. So this is actually an index of 10 cities from Germany during that period of time. So unfortunately, I could, I mean, this has been, this is why it's taking so long because it's not like that information is easily available. It's not. And so we're going to be looking at an index on uh, nominal house prices. And this runs between 1870 and 1935. And this is 1919, what I'm showing you right now. And the index at that time was roughly at 200. So the hyperinflation was already in gear and you can kind of see it here. House prices were going up. House prices have been going up all over the world because of all the money printing and the, and the cheap credit. By 1922, that uh, index was up to 450. But by 1924, when they did the restructuring and the reset, it was down at 70. So what does that actually look like? Let's take a peek because, because real estate nominal prices dropped 84.5%. To put it another way, at 1919 at roughly 200 marks, that's 170 marks per ounce to buy gold. We saw that on the previous, on the previous um, slide. And so, 1.17 ounces of gold would buy an index, one of the indexes. It's an average of the nominal price houses in 10 cities. But by 1922, when it hit a peak, and, and this was the start of it, so the marks per ounce of gold were up at 396,000 marks and we weren't in the full blown hyperinflation yet. You could still buy 1,003 times this index. So if you were holding gold, this is how it was actually less than 25 ounces of gold when you do these calculations out, could buy an entire city block buildings and all. Let's see. So, and I hope you can see that. You see how it drops because when they reset a currency, everything drops, everything does. But if you hold your purchasing power, it's in this sweet spot here when they do that reset, that gives you the best advantage. And we'll see it in the cup formation. So just stay tuned because we talk about that and I show you that all the time. So here we go. Those who could quickly adapt to a world they had never seen before 
a world turned upside down, prospered. And how could they quickly adapt? Because they had everything in place. Food, water, energy, security, barter ability, wealth preservation, community, and shelter. They could adapt because they weren't scared. They had everything in place. If you've been pro procrastinating, if you've been postponing, will you please stop? I mean, seriously, will you please stop? At this time, an entire city block of commercial real estate, and this is from uh, Robert Kiyosaki's book. At this time, an entire city block of commercial real estate in downtown Berlin could be purchased for just 25 ounces of gold. But you can, you can see how that could even be expanded, quite honestly. Those who held their wealth in the form of currency became poorer and poorer as they watched their purchasing power destroyed by the government. Do we not see our purchasing power being destroyed by this government and by these central banks that are just printing money? For what? I mean, supposedly we're in recovery. We're not. We're not. All of the experiments that have gone on, particularly since 2008, all they've done is create some kind of semblance of things getting better. But if they really were, we wouldn't have a K-shaped recovery. It's that that wealth gap grows wider and wider as the governments and the central banks devalue the currency because those in the know are converting into hard, hard assets, hard assets that are movable. And yes, Mark G, fixed rate mortgages do get restructured. So you want to be able to pay them off in a moment's notice. Did you do that? Did you put that? Okay. <laughs> okay. So good. Go ahead and, and do that. That's good. Those who held their wealth in, in the form of gold watched their purchasing power ex increase exponentially as they became wealthy by comparison. So during financial upheaval, a bubble popping, a market crash, a depression, or a currency crisis such as this one, wealth is not destroyed, it is merely transferred. How many times have you heard me say that? Wealth never disappears. It simply shifts location. So the goal is to have that wealth shift your way. And you do that by holding your purchasing power intact. And frankly, gold and silver are the only undervalued assets. And gold is the only financial asset that runs no counterparty risk. None. You hold it, you own it outright. So let's go look at Greece. Now, Greece was interesting. And, and I'm going to tell you, the, the specific data on all of this is really, really hard to dig out. So I did my best. I did my best. Good luck to anybody else. But I definitely did my best. So they had the gold Greek drachma. And they also had the paper drachma. The interaction of non, let's see, what did I say? Okay, continuous deterioration of the purchasing power of the drachma and a deterioration of the drachma's foreign exchange value in terms of gold, which in turn led to loss of confidence in the drachma and a rise in the velocity of circulation of money. That is the one piece that I have not yet seen reflected in the monetary velocity charts. Remember, I'm watching that pretty consistently. You guys can too. You just go on the FRED, F-R-E-D website, and you can put that in in the search bar, and you'll be able to watch MV2 or M2V, either way. But that's the monetary velocity of money. So we haven't seen that shift yet, but... People are shopping, they're, they're, they're spending money. So I'm sure we're going to see that shortly. First introduced by the occupation forces in order to facilitate their domestic purchases of goods and services. But as confidence in the drachma deteriorated, it largely replaced the paper drachma as a medium of exchange and as a store of value. Why? Why? Because gold 
it anywhere in the world. This is globally accepted money. So anywhere in the world you could go and have the same level of purchasing power. So the paper drachmas, nobody wanted to accept them. They had no confidence in it. And that's the whole piece. That's why all you, when you're listening to the central banks, et cetera, what are they talking about? They're talking about expectations and consumer confidence. It's the expect, it's not reality. It's what the public expects and how much confidence the public has in the currency, in the, in the central banks, in the government. That's the big key. And it's not whether one bank trusts another bank. Heck no, it's the public. There are way more of us than there are of them. This development suggests that Grisham's law was reversed. And that is the good money, example, the gold, sovereign pushed the bad money, the paper drachma out of circulation. But in the beginning, it's just the opposite. People would rather spend that paper drachma and hoard and hold the gold. And I certainly do. Okay. Because I totally get what's happening to the U S dollar to this stinky piece of paper that has virtually no vets. Really, this is really officially three cents worth of purchasing power. So let me show you what happens when confidence is lost. And this was, and this was during, um, between 1940 and 1948. And this study looked at banknotes in circulation, the cost of living and a gold sovereign. And a gold sovereign is not a full ounce of gold, by the way, it is just, uh, this sovereign is probably a 20th or a 10th of an ounce, depending upon which size it is, which frankly I can't tell. But in April, 1941, they all were the same. Everybody started out at one, but by 1944, I mean, I think that you can see that the cost the banknotes in circulation exploded, which is what's happening here, right? Been happening since 2008, but went on to steroids in 2020 along with the cost of living, which exploded. And I mean, is that not what's happening here right now? Is that not what's happening around the world right now? But the difference then was they didn't have the paper markets to suppress the price of gold. And so gold went up as it normally would as the true flight to safety as an asset that has full functionality across every single area of the global economy. So you can see that gold absolutely maintained and then some your cost of living. It holds its purchasing power value. That's it's in my opinion, the single most important function of gold it has lots of functions. It's the most functional asset that there is that in silver, but the key here is its most important function is to hold purchasing power between 1948 and uh, 1945 and 1948, when they did the reset, you can see that everything got reset, but it still outperforms the cost of living because that's what gold does when it's not manipulated. But again, a rising gold price is an indication of a failing currency. Now I'm going to take us to the most recent piece of Greece because that I could get hard numbers on, which was not also not really easy, but I, I love this. I love my work. I really love my work. It's so interesting. I learn so much all the time, but these are taxes as a share of GDP. And what I want to focus on is the immovable property tax, because I think that you can see that that expanded this red band here got bigger over time as Greece was going through the sovereign debt crisis and as recurrent. So that means annual proper immovable property taxes per capita per year, but as a share of disposable income. Well, I mean, it's pretty obvious where it was in 2006 
and where it ended up in 2016, right? Understand too, that Greek property, just like U.S. property, just like property around the world, because frankly, it's one of the largest shares of GDP that there is, is property. It was not allowed to fully express, in other words, go down as low as it should have. So we're not even looking at a reset circumstance because they could not hyperinflate the drachma. And I'm going to show you that in just a second but everything grows. And by the way, immovable property taxes are a preferred tax because you can't put it on your back and move. You can't hide it. So it is a preferred tax that they will use to get more money out of you, which is why you need the smaller fractional pieces of gold or a lot of silver to pay those property taxes. So it kind of depends. I kind of like to do it with gold, but if you have a lot of silver, you'll be able to do it with that as well. Okay. So during this period of time, I hope you can remember it because Greece was put under, you know, they got all these loans and they were put under austerity, which of course nobody's doing austerity. This was a big experiment to see how it would fare and it didn't work very well. But there was a time, and I personally think they should have gone back to the drachma, but they were not going to let Greece out of the euro. They were not going to let that, allow that to happen. Uh, in Great Britain, it was different because they never adopted the currency, but in Greece, they did. So Greeks started accumulating physical gold in anticipation of bank holidays, which, by the way, they did get, uh, and also the need to return to the drachma, which did not happen. But what did they fly to? So people, we've been taught that gold is an old relic, except that central banks are accumulating it like crazy. It's not. This has been in our DNA for thousands of years. People know that gold has value. They'll remember it again. I promise you, they will remember it again. I did not forget it. This is spot gold in terms of Greek drachmas, and we also did it in terms of the euro. So here we are in 2006, and this is what happened to gold during this period of time. And again, it was not allowed to fully express where it should have gone because they couldn't, they couldn't hyperinflate the drachma since they were on the euro. But let's look at what happened in general to real estate during this period. This is offices, retail, industrial, and residential. And you can see here we are 2009 at a peak. And then, of course, it bottomed. Now, is this a cup? Maybe. It's probably a little bit too soon to tell in 2013 whether or not we were near a bottom. But I want to point this out to you because we will be paying very close attention to this to determine when it is time to convert what you have here, some of it, not all of it, but some of it into income producing real estate. I mean, but can you see that at least in here it's forming? So it looks like we probably did get a bottom there. And you're never, if you ever get into anything at the very bottom or out at the very top, frankly, that is luck. But you just want to be in there somewhere near a bottom, out somewhere near a top, and then you've done really well. So we'll be paying attention to that cup formation. Hopefully we will get, well, well, we will see the bottom. We'll see it. I know that. And hopefully we will be able to, if you have gold, act on it and take advantage and have the wealth transfer your way. Because even during that period of time, Greek residential real estate fell precipitously but if you had gold and you could go in, then you could definitely take advantage of what happened because spot was up a lot more than that, 467% during that same period of time. But since the Greeks could not devalue their currency, what did they do? They mined more gold locally. Look at this. 
This is in 2016, and the level of mining increased. What, was it because they found more gold? No, there is a finite amount of gold in this world, whether it's in the ground or it's above the ground, regardless of what form it's in. There's a finite amount of it. So if you cannot devalue your currency and you're trying to create a stable base and you have gold that you can mine, that's what you're going to do. You're going to mine more gold. And then this is what it looked like in 2002. You could have, it would have taken you 775.5 ounces of gold to buy the average house. By 2013, it was only 117.86 ounces to buy the average house. Do you see my point? And this isn't even a full, this wasn't a full reset. This was just Greece being in deep doo-doo. Well, we're in way more than deep doo-doo now because we have to reset the system. The system no longer functions, it no longer works, and I hope you can see that. So let's look at Venezuela, okay? Now, Venezuela is really interesting because they're going through that right now. And it was, and, and again, I'm gonna tell you, during a hyperinflationary event, the, the data that is created is sketchy at best if it even exists or it's buried, so even if it does exist, I don't know that I will ever find it, but fortunately I've been watching Venezuela for a while and, and I have gotten some screenshots. But this is the amount of time that it's taken for the money to lose 99% of its value and Venezuela's had three lopping off of the zeros, the most current one in October. So this is the official rate. This is a black market rate, and you can see how the official rate, just like when we look at interest, we look at gold, et cetera, it's, it's official, so that just means that they want it to look like they want it to look. But that is not reality when you're going out into the real world. And we've talked a number of times of what happens to real estate in Venezuela, but just like in the US, just like all around the world, where we're seeing property values rise in terms of the local currencies, it's just nominal confusion. Because this house, the house that I'm in right now, was built in 1929. Okay, well, it's the same house for all those years, almost 100 years, because we're going into to 2022. Has that changed? No, that has not changed but the value of the paper dollars that it takes to buy it has definitely changed. And the cost to maintain it with all of that inflation has definitely changed. So it's not that this house has gone up, it's that the currency has gone down. That's really what happens. So now look at, the, I, I'm so glad that I actually had this because I couldn't go back and get any historic data. If somebody knows how to, I'd appreciate it. If anybody's in Venezuela and wants to do boots on the ground or any place that is currently living through hyperinflation, please have them contact services at ITM Trading. So these are property prices in Venezuela in 2018. The price to income ratio is 160.34. In 2018 in the US, it was 7.4. So it shows you that the price to income ratio in Venezuela is really, I mean, the average person cannot afford a house. It's just that simple. A mortgage as a percentage of income is over 3,300%. <laughs> Loan affordability index, 0.03, the loan is not affordable, period. Because, and the price to rent even is at 24.33. Price to rent in the, not in the city center is a little bit higher than that. But here's the reason why I'm putting this out because so many people have rental property and they feel really safe and, and, and secure in that, except that you get to a point where people can't pay their rents. So the gross Rental yield in the city center is 4.11%. The historic 
grow or actually net rental yield should be 10%. So this is gross. This is before you have any property taxes, any maintenance, any repairs. I mean, this is not a good way to generate income because it's going to cost you more money to maintain this. Now this, remember, you know, governments don't really want you to know what in the world they're doing, but this is gold to the uh, Venezuelan Bolivar Fuerte, the strong Bolivar, right? And this was the first reset, November 13th, 2011 to March of the, okay. Uh, let's see, let's move on. Okay, so this is between 2011 and 2016. So this was the first reset that we just looked at and it looked pretty big, right? This is the second reset back in 2016 overnight reset so in 2018 the currency changed from vef the strong bolivar to ves the sovereign bolivar hmm did that help well let's just talk about real estate a little bit more and we're going to go ahead and look at that in a second Thousands of Venezuelan landlords who in the past struggled to become homeowners who later rented see their assets depreciated even more after the implementation of the new monetary cone, which eliminated five zeros to the Bolivar and therefore has made it unfeasible for tenants to pay rent leases that were already ridiculous because of the government's control in the context of hyperinflation. So what do you think that that does to the nominal price of the real estate if you cannot generate rent on it and you can't pay your mortgage? It's coming down. I mean, obviously. And, you know, where we're seeing part, part of what I've seen, and I think we've seen at ITM trading is people are going, well, maybe I'll buy real estate instead of gold, because look at how much real estate is going up. Well, I got news for you. Nothing goes straight up, just like nothing goes straight down. You gotta have some big bouncing along the way, and that has not been allowed in this environment. Mortgage moratoriums, rent moratoriums, I mean, and so many other shenanigans just to maintain the value of real estate and to push it up. Interest rates at zero. So, hey, I can buy a, a more expensive house because my payments are the same. Well, look, everything works until it doesn't. Middle-class families in Caracas metropolitan area defended themselves against tolerable inflation by renting their apartments or selling them at a high price. At, that at the time, they thought they were making fine deals, as many in that position did. But since September 2016, apartments have lost, and this is to 2018, so two years, Apartments have lost 68% of their year-to-year -year value and people sold over 40% more apartments that brought a vicious cycle of oversupply with property brutally depreciating. So since 2008, big corporations have come in and taken over the market and since they can get money for free, even way better than you and I certainly, then they bid up the houses because they took all that debt and they turned it into a security that they sold back to you in your retirement or your pension plan. It's genius, but you gotta know because how many times can you be lied to when you do not know the truth? And they're talking about now, they're talking about the real estate market softening, which is really good for first time home buyers and individual home buyers because the market's softening and the prices are coming down. No, the prices are not coming down, but the market is softening. Well, Zillow is not one of those that are in there buying thousands and thousands of houses, but they are now having to sell thousands and thousands of houses. If you've waited this long, you might want to wait a little bit longer. 
So let's look at gold to real estate. And this is happening right now. 2021. I can't even tell you how glad I am that I had that from 2018. Okay, 2021. All right, let's make a little comparison here. Price to income ratio, 15.39. So that was actually a little better, huh? But in the U.S., it's 5.3. Still, is real estate in the U.S. affordable for most? No, it is not. No, it is not. Mortgage as a percentage of income, well, it's not over 3,000% anymore. It's still 372, see, 373% of income. So it's a little more affordable, but it's not affordable for the normal person in Venezuela. Price to rent, outside, inside the city center. Okay, the gross rental yields up a little bit, almost 8%, but that's before you pay your taxes and, and all other expenses to maintain this property. So it's not a good deal. You are not getting paid for the risk that you are taking, and that's the risk to your principal. So if we look at between August 2018, when they went to the new currency, and October 5th, because then... They lopped off three zeros, or six zeros rather, right here, okay? Third, I don't know how many times they're gonna lop off zeros. You know, on average, it's about three times, but they definitely have an, at least another one in the cards. So let's look at that. In Bolivars in 2018, it was 103,000, uh, 940. The Bolivar per ounce of gold was 29.42. So it took you 35.33 ounces of gold in Venezuela to buy the average house. But 10.521, well, let's see. There's one, two, three, four. It takes 0.00001 one, so that means like a tenth of this size, a tenth of this size to buy a piece of real estate. Now, should you run to Venezuela right now and buy it? Well, we're going to look at that. I'm not saying that it's time yet because I think they got more lopping off, more pain ahead. And uh, I'm going to give you a real life experience with this, but I hope that you can see the opportunity so that you put your wealth in something that can hold its purchasing power value. So when the time comes to move, you have the ability to do it. And here is a real life experience. Me gusta siempre estar invirtiendo, pensando un poquito a futuro. Y cuando vi los precios a los que venden And las Edgar, propiedades uh, en did the Venezuela, on there, sinceramente so you quedé see what, what muy, saying. muy sorprendido. Puedes comprar una casa bastante aceptable con 7 mil, 10 mil dólares. Esta casa que yo estoy por mostrarles me costó 20 mil dólares. Olo Borgo, eso en verdad es muy barato. En muy pocos lugares del mundo encuentras viviendas a estos precios. Y es una casa que está enfrente del mar. De verdad, aquí yo estoy viendo el océano. Una cosita que sí hay que ser honesto con esto. El papeleo, eh, los trámites y demás para hacer una inversión en Venezuela no son del todo sencillos, ¿ok? Sí hay que aclararlo. Pero cuando uno tiene una pareja venezolana, <risa> muchas cosas se facilitan. Así que de mi parte y lo, lo digo porque quiero ser lo más transparente posible no fue una situación difícil pero normalmente si un extranjero si nadie de confianza de suma confianza aquí en el territorio quiere invertir si sí es un trámite larguito ok si sí, no, no quiero que se vayan con la idea de que cualquiera puede llegar e invertir es un trámite larguito es un poquito complicado tener un aliado en el país miren es la opción so that is the whole Point. This is not time to rush to Venezuela because it's not over yet. The whole world is going to be able, is going through the same thing. Look at the opportunities that lie ahead of us. 
This is really the point of the strategy, which if you haven't called and talked to one of our consultants, you should. It's a strategy that's based upon historic norms because I've been studying currency since 1987. So if you're working with us, you're doing the same strategy as me, but tweaked for your goals and your circumstances and what you have to work with. But my personal goal in all of this and why I do this work is because I don't think it's okay for you to work your whole life and have it shifted away from you by, I can't even say it because I'm too much of a lady, but I think you can get the drift, right? All you have to do is take advantage of what they are doing for themselves. They are pushing down the price of gold because they don't want you to know that the currency is dying. They're buying it hand over fist. The, they meaning central banks and also the very wealthy because they know what's coming up and they want to be in a position to have the wealth shift their way so that you own nothing. They own everything. But I'm pretty sure if that's what happens, you won't be happy. I know I wouldn't be happy. I wouldn't be happy for you. I wouldn't be happy for my grandchildren. I wouldn't be happy for anybody. Let's beat them at their own game. How about that? Because without a doubt, it is time to get those assets covered, please. And the Wealth Shield is a 12 part strategy, but it's simple because it's based upon repeatable patterns. There's a Calendly link below if you haven't spoken to us yet, call, have that conversation, set up a time because if you procrastinate, quite honestly, it could well be too late. And I would rather be, I don't care, 10 years too early, 20, honestly, I wish I had been smart enough that instead of buying those stupid leather purses when I was, you know, 17 and 18 years old, that I had bought gold from my uncle. I mean, I did buy some, but I didn't do what I should have done because I didn't know I was young and naive. What do you know when you're 17? But now you know, and we're gonna talk a lot more about this. And if you haven't already seen the interview I did with RPAD from Starpath Academy, I mean, I'm very grateful to Canadian Kyle for for bringing him out and because that's how I found him. And I'm in love with this man because he has the experience that we all need. I haven't lived through this yet. I mean, I've lived through a currency restructuring in the seventies. And so I know what that's like, but this is a complete global reset and they got to burn off all the debt they've accumulated since the seventies. So until next we meet, please stop procrastinating, get it done. Food, water, energy, security, barterability, wealth preservation, community, and shelter. And until then, please be safe out there. Bye-bye.